Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. Hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, and he has made it through. Julio Vela, back with the hair looking good. Hey, man. <laughs> you don't look like you put on too much weight. You know, uh, I ate so much tryptophan, I'm you exhausted. I'm, 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 I'm still exhausted. Mm -hmm. But when my co-host nails the federal government with uh, <laughs> and gets a big fat dismissal yeah and I get to sit next to the two lawyers who ran the biggest case in the last four or five months in the state of Texas it's a good day I don't I really got to do day. much yeah we got we got Casey <laughs> Gotro and Thomas Lane here tonight ladies and gentlemen Thomas driven all the way from San Antonio to be on our show hey it sounded like fun well you get ready man because the next hour is gonna be <laughs> rip roaring fun uh, Casey and Thomas, of course, they tried, for those of you who were following along in the news, they tried the first of the Twin Peaks biker cases to go to trial, got a mistrial. We'll be talking with them this evening about that. We'll, uh, we will be taking your phone calls, 713-807-1794. That's the number. You can go off, you eat a bunch of turkey, and you forget the number right away. Uh, so we'll open up the phone lines about halfway through the program so you can call in with your questions and comments. I also have Twitter up right here so you can send me Anything you got <laughs> at HCCLA underscore TV, and we'll do this for the next hour. But guys, before we talk about your trial, because that's the main reason why you're here, I wanna, I wanna talk about what's been going on here in in the news <laughs> lately with all of the sexual harassment in the workplace and politics, mostly in the media. You've had all the celebrities, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, just this week, Matt Lauer gets fi fired. Uh, was it last week? It was Charlie Rose. Um, I'm interested to, and, and Casey, I'm particularly interested to hear your position of it because uh, let's just say you're known for having an opinion on things. Um, you're, pretty, you're a pretty strong female advocate, and, but you're also a criminal defense lawyer. And, and so I wonder from, from your perspective, and, and, and Thomas and Julio, I want you guys to chime in too, we're, we're seeing a lot of old allegations that are coming up, um, stuff that is two, three, four, 10, 10, 20, 30 years old that's now coming out. It's, it's coming out against politicians, it's coming out against celebrities. Um, and, and a lot of it has been focused on the females coming out against males uh, and reporting sexual harassment or inappropriate contact in the workplace, um, and in some cases, sexual assault. And, and so I just kind of want to get your opinion, everybody, from, from the perspective of a practicing lawyer. This stuff's all over the media. How, how do we reconcile perhaps our personal feelings about what the, the victims, the complainants are, are doing and, and they're, the, they're coming out and reconcile that with what we have to go through in terms of defending our clients on these allegations. I mean, this, this puts us, I feel like uh, this is one of those things you really have to question a jury about because of the, the constant bombardment of exposure that they're getting every day in the media on this. Mm. You're stumped. I stumped you. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I have a colleague of mine actually right now that, um, had a personal experience very similar to what you've just described what's in the media mm -hmm. and I think that for women certainly the if you as a woman in a in a field that is is dominated, dominated. primarily by men yeah um, it is not easy to take an unpopular position and what I have seen is men in power using that power um, to take some advantage clean advantage in some cases and to me, as a woman, it makes sense why charges aren't pursued, why she doesn't say anything, because you run some very serious risks of being ostracized and foregoing an entire career. Um, so that is a difficult issue for me personally, because there's what I know about what it's like to have to work in a male-dominated field, right? and then what I know as an advocate and having to combat what I see, what my jurors are going to hear in the media. And you see it too. Yeah, you know, they're tried and convicted before we even know when this happened. Well, I mean, like with with Matt Lauer. I mean, the the I mean, he's immediately fired. Uh, the stories start coming out, and they're bad. 
I mean, the, the stories are bad, but it's, it, there's been no trial. There's, there's, there's been no, nothing, no, <coughs> nobody's had to really put on any evidence and, 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 and meet a burden of proof other than the, the New York Times and Variety magazine have been able to basically, you know, scare NBC into a reactionary firing from, from my point of view. And granted, the allegations are bad, but how, how, how do you reconcile something like that with what we have to do? I mean, it, you know, in terms of if you're questioning a jury, if you've got a client who is accused of sexual assault, um, I mean, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? Do you, I mean, it's tough because, because I believe that, you know, look, some of the stuff, you look at some of the interviews that Lauer did, they're creepy. <clears throat> they're just creepy. He's and so, creepy. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's, it's not hard to believe. And so, if, if, I'm, <laughs> if I, as somebody who <clears throat> represents people in court and tries to poke reasonable doubt in things, is, is, is already having that thought in my mind, it's like, what is, what is the jury panel that I might have thinking? You know, I, I have to, and this is from... And feel free to chime in. Don't, don't just sit there in silence, man. <laughs> Bust your way right in. Yeah. So, you know, some subjects I, I just try to stay away from. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this show, man. We, we go right in. He also oh. may be still shell shocks, but, um, <laughs> you know, what I saw, sir, even in Waco, you yeah. know, we had 300 people uh, for our panel, and we had like an eight-page questionnaire, and there were a number of women specifically that said that when asked if there was any reason why they didn't want to be on the jury, said, I'm afraid of retaliation. Um, mm. And ostensibly from my client and or the club that he belonged to. Yeah. Uh, and what I found is when we brought those folks back into the, into the to chambers to talk about it, readily confessed that I watched too much TV. And you know what? I think I can stay open. And one woman in particular ended up staying on our jury and was Jake's biggest advocate. Mm. So I, I, I think that... <coughs> there's a knee-jerk reaction to see the thing on the television set and to formulate some opinions. But given an opportunity in a setting where it's like this to, to think critically about it, I, I have, and I might be a little pie-eyed in the sky, but I've, I've found jurors very willing to set that aside. I, I hate to, I hate to say, to, to say, oh, well, as a woman, have you, uh, how was it dealing with it in Waco? Because I think just as an advocate, I hate the fact that uh, I have to, we, we asked this question, but you have been um, a pillar and a, a beacon for women's strength in a male-dominated field, mm. okay? At least in the community here in Houston, uh, Casey Gotro is somebody who stands up for and represents for the the systematic decades of male dominated uh, power here in in Houston, and so I'm going to ask it: Did you did you feel that in Waco, and how are you receiving that now? And 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 do you feel that? Because I'm telling you, from an outsider looking in, uh, Casey Grocho, number one in my book, and in most books, says advocate. Period. Number one, but Number two, oh yes, and she happens to be a woman, but that that secondary thing means a lot to a lot of people. And so, did you feel that in Waco? Did you feel that coming coming through? Or and how have you uh, dealt with that in your in your career? You know, I I'll I'll tell you that in my experience, the folks the the and I think I'm thinking about judges. I'm thinking about prosecutors, like the the folks that I've had to work with in this field. Um, that are good at their jobs and are doing their jobs, right? Whether it's seeking justice or being unbiased and neutral in their decision making. Um, I don't get singled out for being a woman. It's when I'm dealing with someone that is perhaps, uh, it's a low blow. It's a low blow. Like at some point I remember the prosecutor saying, oh, the best prosecutor in the room today had on a skirt. And you know, that came back to bite him in the butt. I can't cuss, can I? It's a bad, bad idea. Okay. I think it's a little bit. Okay. So Actually, it's... I don't think you can. You can say ass. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it came back to bite him in the ass. Um, but it's... I'm acutely aware of it. I was certainly the, the only woman in the, in the well that was, that was doing any work. And, it, and it, for us, in our case, because the state's theory was that these banditos are sexist and misogynistic and, you know, just loathe women. And then 
I have six foot five of Bandito sitting next to me that has taken the most important decision in his life right. and put them in these hands. Right. So it's a, I don't know how to answer that question really, except to say that when the people that, that are good at their jobs, that are doing their jobs, don't get distracted by the fact that, you know, we use different bathrooms. Uh, that comes up when somebody's losing and needs to. What about the article that was written about you? During the tr during the trial, where it, 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 there was oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that it, it, it I don't know. Well, which article, right? Well, the, the one. Right, was, which one? Yeah, right? I mean there was a ton of, but the, but I mean there was the 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 one that kind of focused on your mannerisms in the courtroom. Bouncy, the bouncy one. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yeah, like bouncy. yeah, and, I, and and it was. You know, the the reporter, everybody joked, well, you know, Casey has a stalker kind of thing. But the parts of it were, you know, almost like, it, it, and this is historically, I think, a, a problem with a lot of female lawyers who are very aggressive is that, you know, reporters or other people view it as a bad thing. Whereas if a male did it and, and did the same exact thing you did, they would be cheered for it. So one, so... I, I kind of drown that noise out, and, yeah. and my litmus test is often, you know, what would Dan Cogdale do in this situation? <laughs> I like it. Because I like it. <laughs> Dan Cogdale is kind of who I want to be when I grow up, and if Dan can do it, damn it, I can do it. <laughs> and I tend to drown out the rest of that noise. Like, I just, I, I don't notice it. You said you had an eight-page questionnaire. Was that, I mean, um, juror questionnaires, at least in state practice, is not something that I'm very familiar with or experience. Is that something that you, you say an eight page questionnaire, is that a court questionnaire? Is that something that you and the prosecutor were able to kind of bang out? It was the craziest, <laughs> I mean, Thomas, it was, so there was this, so going into the case, I, I, I came on late, like March 23rd of this year was my first appearance on the case. And, and I did my due diligence. I spoke to all the, the lawyers that had other clients in the case. And I was consistently told, you've got to change venues. We're not going to get a fair jury. You've just, we've got to do, you need to change. Because that's and, up to you. Right. Because <laughs> it's Cause, completely up to me and my magic wand. Yeah. Um, so wave my venue wand. So they brought in like 300 veneer men. We had this ridiculous eight page questionnaire that it, it, frankly, it gets so long at some point, it's useless. You know, you have to make this rapid decision about who gets on and who doesn't. Like it, it just stopped being <coughs> effective at some point and we didn't even make it past what the first quarter? No, I mean, we had, uh, we had this ridiculous chart of, you know, checks and minuses and all these different symbols that, you know, when we're sitting there trying to make, you know, intelligent strikes, it's just impossible to read. It was impossible to read, and then, so, so, what's the question, Jimmy? I mean, it's just, The eight-page the, the eight questionnaire. It was, it was Julio's question. I, I remember, Sorry. I remember about, hurts I, I actually think, I actually think it, it caused us more stress than helpful in a lot of situations. And I it say did. that because we looked back at, after, at it after the fact, and we said, wow, we let this guy get onto the jury. And we looked at his questions with, you know, with a magnifying glass, and we saw that, wow, that's, that's not good for us, and neither is this. Oh, you know, he, he's not good on Fifth Amendment rights or, you know, whatever the issue was. And, and we, were, we were really sweating that for a while. And at, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they all came back to the same thing. And that was that this, it just, Jake is a, was a great guy. He killed it in his direct examination. Like, when asked if he was a bandito, I am, and I hope to be buried in this cut. I'm not a criminal. Wow. And unapologetic. And just a phenomenal human being. Honestly, the best, the best evidence, the best asset that we had was Jake. And, and to tie that back into this, um, this idea of the, the court of public opinion, I remember talking to people you know, before the trial, during the trial, when you know, I was back in San Antonio in bits, and everyone was just telling me, you know, oh, y'all are sunk. And I felt like we were on very strong, very firm legal ground, you know, regarding this, you know, this, is he a member of a gang issue that came up? Um, and it was a you know, central issue of the trial, of the trial. Thomas, and did you have any idea what you were stepping into? I have, oh, of course not. <laughs> of course I not. mean, really, did you have any idea what you were getting uh, Of into? course not. No. Um, I, you know, it was like drinking from a fire hose, right? And that's, <laughs> Did, uh, that's Casey Gotro. <laughs> so were you all able to prepare a questionnaire or was it a court questionnaire or we had input on it? It was a it was a collaborative effort and I'll tell you that it was that that questionnaire was uh, consistent with and symbolic of the state's entire theory and that it was just general. As big and complicated as they could make it, um, 
was the, the closest thing they could get to a conviction because if they looked at just my client and what happened on that day at 1230 on a Sunday in Waco, they couldn't get there from here. Whether there was any evidence of him regularly or continuously engaging in criminal activity. And that's what they hung up on. <laughs> where's, where's the, the first time Jake was ever arrested was Twin Peaks. You know, he's been a bandito for five years. And th <laughs> if you live in Texas, the banditos have a, they have an unenviable history. That is, that is the God's honest truth. Yeah. But this, Thomas called it a legal fiction. What we saw was these ATF and other law enforcement experts coming on and, and, and reciting historical fact, historical fact. When are we um, going to get past this idea that law enforcement can teach law enforcement about, you know, gangs? Sort of regurgitating each other's ideas as experts, but they're using historical facts to say that today, today, Jake Carazal, who's been in this club for five years, is somehow criminally responsible for something that happened when he was two. So, so, you, so they had to stay open to this idea that, that that a club could change, that people can change. I'm better today than I was 10 years ago. Are well, you? I mean, I met Casey about 10 years ago, <laughs> and I will tell you, <laughs> she is a much better person today than, <laughs> when, you, I was, than when we were Thank hanging you. out. I appreciate that. Uh, speaking of crazy jury charts, I tried a case with Casey about eight or nine years ago, and I was making pluses and minuses, <laughs> and it was my first jury trial ever, probably. and. We're sitting there and discussing the jury and, 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 you know, making our strikes. And she says, damn it, JV, your, your notes are supposed to make sense. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so sorry. But I imagine you did better than that. Oh, no, not much better. No, yeah, we, of course. Right in the same right. boat. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't hurt me anymore. <laughs> the, the, jury, the, the jury questionnaire thing is interesting to me. I mean, because you had, you brought in a panel of 300. Mm -hmm. um, it is rare to get to get jury questionnaires like that in state court. But I, I think it was just the two of y'all, right? I mean, did you have a, a, any other support we, staff? We did have a lot of a big support staff, actually. We did. Um, How many people? My investigator was there. We had a, a, a fellow named David Devereaux, who is, mm -hmm. he's actually the spokesperson and founder of the Motorcycle Profiling Project. And Will was, Delaney? Will Delaney, who is a, he's a professor at the University of Alabama that were critical, certainly in, in my learning curve, like understanding this community. <laughs> and I can sit before you today and say that I still don't completely understand um, this motorcycle community, but that was kind of our theme. You yeah. don't have to. And, and David and Will were so instrumental in at least getting us up to speed on that. How, how long did y'all get to question the panel? It was, it felt like a week. Uh, I think the state's, the state's board I took a whole day. Wow. It you was painful. You didn't do a whole 300? Of the, no. No. I mean, how did, um, were they brought in, in pieces? And well, no, okay, yes. Yeah. So we had the entire 300 in one room, and there were these crazy pillars that you couldn't even see past. Um, I had a microphone, like a cordless microphone, to walk around the room so that the court reporter could hear what these folks were saying in response to the questions. And it was just, I mean, you've heard the state's vore dire. It just the one way kind of droning we were all yeah. falling asleep i was in the middle of the group like <laughs> what does literally this, the price what is, is this right puzzle? does do you recognize this as a puzzle <laughs> of, of a gun it <laughs> was, but there's some pieces missing <laughs> the, uh, who, the, did you call them out on that or, or or is the prosecutor saying what does this look like no it was all of the standard can things that you've ever seen from a state's prosecution which <laughs> i saw in this case um i've also never seen uh as much blatant perjury just I mean as an officer of the court you know that we're all held to a higher standard and the ease at which officers of the court prosecutors would lie was breathtaking to me just yeah like they've been doing it for a very long time without consequence well and they 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 didn't turn over a bunch of evidence to you then they turned some over in after you start trial um, and then I, I I still question whether or not you really ever got everything because, I haven't. I, you know, the feds have probably held back some stuff that you're, you are likely entitled to, uh, that they weren't willing to give up on this deal. That is a true story. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, Jimmy, the, the things that were turned over to us in the middle of trial, if they had given that to us prior to trial, it would have affected your they couldn't strategy. have put on this, they couldn't have put their case on. Those yeah. experts that testified about what this conflict was really about, mm-mm. Every single piece of late disclosed evidence undermined their theory of prosecution. Well, they, Every yeah. single piece. 
And then you have prosecutors on the record making an argument that, well, I didn't believe this this witness, so therefore I don't have to give this piece of evidence to you. It was Kelly Siegler all over again. Like, if she thinks they're crazy and don't make any sense, then it's not, it, then you're not entitled to it, defense attorney. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Did the jurors pick up on that? Yes, they did. They did. And we were lucky. Enough. Well, you know, we forgot to mention Vivek Jampala. He was a, another co-counsel. He was, you know, <clears throat> very active making a record of all, you know, keeping track of all of these issues throughout the trial for us. So we, yeah, we both had our own appellate section. So the state did, and then Vivek was ours. Um, but the, 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 they could not have tried this case the way they wanted to if they had given me that evidence. Mm -hmm. And I saw this, the, so the, the first chair in McLennan County is this guy named Michael Jarrett. And I, I did see a shift in his behavior midway through trial. Like, at one point, I'm getting records middle of trial from DPS, and Michael's looking at them, and I can tell from his face he's never seen them before. Wow. So it's not just McLennan County. The bad guy in this entire pros prosecution is the Department of Public Safety. Well, and that would well, be DPS. And you issued subpoenas on this stuff. And yeah. I, and Many. They were, and they were quashed. Yes. And it was were. more than that, though, because at one point, Michael was saying, well, Judge, we'd like that, too, and he was corrected. He was corrected and April elected DA dead. comes in and says, oh, we've already received that. And my, no, really. So I, it's there, there were filters of information. Um, so DPS would generate it and we DPS is boots on the ground for any federal investigation in Texas. Sure. Have you seen the federal indictment for the Bandidos case out of San Antonio? Long time ago. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't looked at it recently. Is that the one Schaefer was on? No. It, yeah, Schaefer was on it, and I think Dick DeGaron is now uh, counsel for Jeff Pike. So it tracks all of these predicate acts from 2013. Mm -hmm. Gets all the way up to Waco, skips it, <laughs> and then continues. Ha! Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Just hanging and hanging it low. It's interesting, isn't it? Wow. So they just, they just decide to omit that blinders on well because it was uh, such a poorly investigated case i mean uh, I, or the setup didn't go the way they wanted it exactly and they they, they don't want it to turn all that over you think it was set up i thought it was just mastermind by abel no i i we the surveillance footage from the surrounding businesses around twin peaks i can see a dps agent walking um bikers who have taken their cuts off off the scene letting them leave and then walking some back in Mm, and then when I cross-examined him at trial, uh, I'll put it to you this way. There wasn't a DPS agent that testified, truthfully. Not one of them. And so I don't know what the real story is, but I am chomping at the bit to find out. You know, they haven't said whether or not they're going to retry K Jake, and I, I represent his father as well. Mm -hmm. And so one or the other, I, I'd like to get to the, real, to the bottom of it. So when do they have to make their decision to retry him or not. I mean, where, 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 where's the case stand procedurally right now? I'm pretty sure Michael Jarrett would chew his foot off before he gets back in a courtroom with me. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you have, a, do you have a, a status conference or anything on it, Seth? Nope. And strangest thing ever, if you've ever had a mistrial or, or, or something, the trial ends suddenly, the, the judge will remind the defendant that you're still on bond. These are your conditions of bond. You have to show up to court this day. Judge Johnson was like, y'all have a nice weekend. Huh? We, we left. left the courtroom without a court we left setting. Clinton County. <laughs> quickly, quickly, without a court setting, without an admonishment, and and Jake admitted that he he'd managed to go from vice president to president of his chapter, even though the bond conditions were he wasn't supposed to be associating. But what? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, so what was? So you, you see the jury. What what's your opening like? What the evidence? I reserved show? my opening. You reserved it? Yes, sir. Yep. I think I, I just remembered that you actually did that. I mean, looking back is the only way to do it, right? The story, yes. the narrative was changing throughout, you know, over the first four weeks of the state's trial. I couldn't, look, I knew going in I was going to be doing pre-trial discovery in the middle of trial and I wasn't going to tie myself to a story. Mm -hmm. um, on some level, like Jake, when he testified, he had a, 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 an over-under Derringer yeah. that his dad had given him years ago that, that he carried with him when he rode. Uh, hardly the weapon you carry if you're walking into a war. Um, right. And at some point, this I don't know if the state thought that we were going to lie about that or not admit that or or what, but all of those bullets that were fired, but they had an ATF expert that, excuse me, Thomas actually questioned, never identified a weapon or a bullet that killed which person. I had to do that. The defense had to do that. So and that's stuck in the jury's craw. Like, why didn't they tell us which bullets 
fire, who killed who? Right. Well, so was it just an engaging in organized criminal activity charge or were, were, were there additional counts as well? Jake had, originally it was just the engage, two counts of engaging, first one being uh, murder is the underlying, nine counts of murder, second one being 18 counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And then, what did we do? They called it a superseding. Well, yeah, they called it a superseding. We had done something, I, I don't remember at this point what it was, but they re-indicted him and added the directing a criminal street gang, which is 25 to life. Hmm. And for a man that's, you know, 36 years old? Barely gotten a speeding ticket in his life. That's a scary proposition. Two young children. <coughs> um, there were some scary times there, even as weak as the evidence was. Uh, I, I think uh, I asked this earlier, and it's something to clear up. Um, they actually had to plead the matter, pardon me, the matter and means for everything. Yeah. That's amazing. And they had to read this out in open court. The entire thing. And we did not waive reading of the indictment. How long did that take? <laughs> About 30 minutes. Jeez. Both times. Pre-trial and during trial. You wrote it, you can write it. What? I, did you get any kickback from waving the open? That's pretty bold. That's huge. I mean, somebody had to have told you, what the hell are you doing? Did, did you? I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of kickback about a lot of things. Oh, fair enough. The, ca the case, so May of 2015, right? 177 folks charged. Uh, Nobody managed to go to trot, like nothing was happening. And so I'm Johnny come lately. I show up in March of this year and just do the thing that I do. And that's get to trial and made a lot of lawyers unhappy about that. Like I'm being irresponsible and this should be bikers versus law enforcement. And what is she doing? And it's just, you know what it's like it, you, you to drown out the noise and do your job. Let me ask you this. You said, what is she doing? That goes back to like. Mm. <laughs> you said it. I mean, I, it's true. It's like, it, it's I mean, true. We're, it's a male dominated field. You're blazing a path. Like you're number one, you're advocate. Like, I mean, you, you I mean, you probably did something that 99.99999% of the individuals, humans on this, who are licensed in the state of Texas, much less licensed in the planet, uh, did. Um, did you, I mean, how did you, I mean, and, and you're sitting there and you're defending this guy this, this, this dude with this huge, I mean, this huge <laughs> presence and everything. And the only thing between him and the government is you. Yes. And Thomas. Hey, and uh, Vex. Yes. But yeah, well, I, I can speak about that yeah. a little bit. And, and I would disagree that there's, that people were looking at Casey like, you know, she did that. And what I mean by that is we had to recuse the first judge involved in the case. Um, and, and all of the people that were, had been pushing that issue were all, were all female attorneys, strong, powerful female attorneys that had been pushing that issue and, and fighting to recuse that, that original judge in that case. And I, I actually, it was, a, it was kind of a, you know, a moment of epiphany for all of these biker dudes, and they're looking around, and, and all of their, the entire thing is being run by female attorneys. It was Susan uh, Chris, um, right. I forget the other young woman's name, and then, yeah, so it was three women that were doing it, uh, so much for that. How did you, how did you <laughs> handle that pressure? Not, I mean, just as an advocate, so, like everybody's eyeing in on you, the entire state is watching you <coughs> and you wave open like, or, and you like go, how did you deal with that? I don't read the paper. I don't answer my phone. I don't, I rarely check emails when I'm in trial, I'm in trial. And my analysis stops and starts with the human being sitting next to me. He's going home to his family, hell or high water, that is happening. So I don't listen to the bullshit that comes from the lawyers around me that have a different opinion and don't think that I know. I've done my homework. And, and to, Move. A, to a large extent also on like day two of the trial, that entire issue of you know, us waving our opening was moot because of the way that the testimony with the experts played out. And I mean, that, this, is, that, this is your story. This is, to me, this is the best part of the entire case because it was hilarious. But how did you tell that story of how that whole thing went down? How did you know that... Um, this trial was going to be also, uh, there's a big component of receiving discovery during the trial. Like, how did you know that was going to happen? So, a, cu a couple of things. <coughs> For as old as this case to have been, right, where, where's the rest of the discovery? What was clear to me very within, within a month was that the only way we're going to get this evidence is to get to trial. And so I'm not asking for a continuance. I would complain often about not getting what I'm entitled to. 
I'm not asking for a continuance because your constitutional rights, you get them all at the same time, like one big aromatic bouquet. Mm -hmm. And I'm not waiving speedy trial to get Brady or due process. I want them now. Judge, so, you've been given everything. Yeah, we, we dispatched with that. But it was, but it was clear that the only way we're going to get 177 people and you haven't gotten one of them to trial in two and a half years? No, no. And I was also mindful of the fact that that federal prosecution was coming. And you know, statistically speaking, what trials in federal court look like. And that ripple effect, I, we weren't, I wasn't having that. that a bandita was going to go to trial before that federal case went. Well, how, because I know Paul Looney was trying to get his client to trial <laughs> and uh, even earlier than, than your case. How, how was it that you managed to get ahead of him <laughs> with all his screaming and yelling? A little bit of luck, a little yeah. bit of blind luck. And this was actually one of the judges that had presided over our, an early recusal hearing. <clears throat> my predecessor was a man, uh, my predecessor, his name escapes me, Landon. Northcutt. Northcutt. And what the judge that presided over the recusal hearing had determined, or his observations were that he's known Landon for a decade and has never known Landon to ever be ready for trial a day in his life. And so from the outside, what it looked like is that the state picked the lowest hanging fruit, the mm -hmm. weakest lawyer, and said, number one with a bullet. And then much to his chagrin, I got shifted in at the last minute. And they just, I mean, within three days of me signing on, it was, they started crawfishing like, ah, there's federal evidence, we need a continuance or. <laughs> we, need, we need to assert Michael Morton <laughs> for, for the state. Cause you know, there's evidence out there that could be maybe, you know, favorable to the defense. So we're asserting it for him. So, so to answer your question, Jimmy, yeah, they think that Michael Morton entitles the state to federal, uh, to favorable evidence. That's. I know. It's breathtaking. I mean, that would explain why Abel Raynham is under investigation himself if, he, <laughs> if that's the way he thinks. Is he, though? I mean, he's a target, is he not? He's the target of a federal investigation. That, that's pretty much clear. And, and um, we've reached the halfway point of the show, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to open up the phone lines. If you want to call in with your questions, comments, 713-807-1794 for Casey Gotro and Thomas Lane. Reminder, Twitter's also up at HCCLA underscore TV. But uh, how is that going to play out? I mean, he's now, it looks like he's been recused on some cases. We've got special prosecutors on a few. He got recused, so. How's that going to play out with, with y'all's case? This is not going to sound good. Um, Raina was one of the prosecutors in Jake's case. And at the same time, Clint Broden right. is kind of agitating from the backside. And he gets Doug Shaver and still has Raina on the case. Well... Raynham files for a continuance because he's in the middle of Jake's trial, and Shaver denies it. He says, you've got 38 prosecutors over there. Send another one here to try it. Raynham then voluntarily recuses the DA's office from yeah, oh, that's the right. Broden prosecution. To me, uh, based on the DPS evidence that I got, Michael Jarrett's surprise, it seems that Raynham's the one that's been doing the filtering. You know, if I have to speculate about that. Oh, and that's not surprising. I mean, look what's come out in these affidavits about him giving, incurring political favors for people, dismissing uh -huh. cases, going into prosecutors' offices, ADA's offices, and saying we're not prosecuting that, or evidence <coughs> all of a sudden going missing in certain cases or being ignored. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like he wields a pretty heavy uh, control over that office. He does, and there was no way he was going to let some other prosecutor from his office start monkeying around with this evidence. Like, he's the sole custodian of it. What, what, it, so, let's say, for instance, I mean, we've got, so we've got, how many special prosecutors do we have now? We have four. Four? Yeah, okay. there are four of them. Mandy, they just added Mandy Miller. And they, Mandy Miller's a special prosecutor? Yes. And He's one of them. So, and I don't know where the investigation may be going or may head it may be headed, but I'm, I'm guessing with 176 people still to possibly try, um, it, it, that's not going to happen anytime soon. At some point, perhaps the the rain investigation uh, gets gets to a point that I mean I don't want to speculate, but it could lead to a removal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Um, All so together. The, the special prosecutors, I, I emailed Froze Merchant yeah. um, and said, I don't really know what the rules are about defense attorneys talking to special prosecutors, but I'd like to talk with you. 
and to show you what the problems are and where you need to start digging. And then I met with Brian Bankin, uh, Brian Roberts, and Froze uh, the night before Broden, one of Broden's hearing, Clint Broden was with us, and just laid out what I see. This is what DPS is doing. The, I, the elected sheriff of McLennan County, three subpoenas I issued for him, not once did he show up, and one of them was a trial subpoena. Has yeah. never produced a record, has never even bothered to come to court. It is the most brazen disregard for law I've ever seen. And the judge just didn't do anything about it. So Strother didn't. By the time we had gotten, you know, the recusal hearing ended, and then the next day we're doing voir dire. And it was, again, I'm with the understanding that I'm going to be conducting pretrial discovery during trial, mm -hmm. uh, didn't get to revisit it. So it's one of those things that fell through the crack. But he just flat out refused to show up. And how did that affect, I mean, in terms of your cross-examination of the, the state's witnesses, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's always, everybody comes up with their rules that they try to teach you, which you're supposed to abide by, which is never ask a question you don't know the answer to. <laughs> Uh, I, and never ask an open-ended question. I mean, it seems like with what, what you're telling me, <laughs> that really had to all go out the door. And it was, it was basically like taking a deposition in a civil case is what it sounds like. Correct. Ow. You know, that's so dangerous. To who? At, this, at this point, it didn't sound like you had anything to lose. Though. To who? I'm, I am, yeah. It is a rare circumstance where the guy sitting next to me has no exposure like legitimately did nothing wrong except what any man in that circumstance would have done. Mm -hmm. And so I won the lottery with respect to my client. Um, and, and that was actually part of my closing argument. You know, the state had been pushing this theory of you're either coward or criminal, uh, failing to recognize that Jake's dad was there, went, rode in with them, his uncle, both men are in their 60s and overweight, outnumbered eight to one. What's he supposed to do, run for the hills? No, no, no. We're not going to do that. And so that was absolutely self-defense. And knowing Jake, the way that he's built, he couldn't have looked himself in the eye the rest of his life if he'd run away from that situation. Let's so get into this. He did nothing wrong. So I could, op I could ask open-ended questions. It was either going to be some more baloney from the ATF about something that happened 20 years ago and all those men are dead or in prison. But it didn't have anything to do with Jake Yeah. Let's, or the let's, Dallas chapter. We got a phone call, so let's uh, get a question in here. Hello, <laughs> thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, um, is that me? That's you. Yeah, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to know when the book is coming out about this thing, because this is a, a perfect Michael Connolly sort of um, uh, book. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a, uh, just an observation. And my question is, uh, you know, how much of this is, you know, politically inspired of this confusion or is in Waco? politically inspired or, or just uh, or just stupidity uh, do, do they do they do they feel like they're gonna let all of this you know uh, you know just run the boards and, and people will forget about these guys that are in jail um, and and I'll uh, and I'll just uh, get off get off the, the air and wait for the answer thank you thank you as as the collage of Casey Casey faces. Uh, yeah, Casey. The, I make funny the faces. Mini, the mini so. faces of Casey. I make funny faces. <laughs> I need I like a poster of that. I need like a, <laughs> like a, like, yes. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you that in then all the years I've practiced law, I've never given a closing argument in a red suit. Yeah. And I did that for the sole purpose of saying, does, am I arrestable? Am I, yeah. am I now a known associate? Because this prosecution and this answers, I think your, your, the caller's question is, what I see is government suppression of political speech. Mm -hmm. You're saying you don't like the colors I'm wearing and the people I'm associating with. And so in response, you're going to prosecute me. You can't do that. You have, a, you have an absolute right um, to associate with like-minded folks. And that's what these people are doing. And that's it. Was that the, the subconscious theme? Or what, was that an actual defense to your... Uh, to your case. So you talk about uh, what you're arguing in closing. Um, did you receive any special instructions? Did you receive any instructions? And did you raise any defenses? Or was it just the underlying theme of, hey, look, uh, these guys, you're, you're profiling them. You, take, you, you, are, you are running this sham investigation and, and you have no proof. I mean, uh, were there any defenses raised 
And did you receive any instructions from the judge or was it more of a... So the, there were at least two men um, that were walking towards Jake, firing their weapons and came narrowly close to killing him before counter snipers dropped them. So on at least, at least two times, Jake's life was saved by the police before he'd even thought to reach for his Derringer. I mean, he is on the ground four to one fighting for his life. And so the self-defense was absolutely in. The defense of third was absolutely in. The, the officers who fired those weapons actually testify that yes, they were firing in defense of that man on the ground that these guys are coming over to shoot. Hmm. Um, and so the, sto the story is real simple. It's there has to be room for courage. And the state wants you to accept this idea of coward or criminal or this bandito boogeyman. And that's not what this was <coughs> about. That is not what this was about. How long, had the, how, was, how long had the federal indictment been pending at the time of the Twin Peaks incident? It had not. So it wasn't under seal or anything? It had not. They were still investigating. Mm. So Twin Peaks happens in May, and then January, I think, 6 of 2016. So and like six months later, out. the federal indi indictment drops. But they had been investigating the events since 2013. The, according to the federal indictment. The indictment tracks. And what's really curious about it is that, so the banditos have, it's called the defense fund because their members are being targeted for associating. And so the state has tried to, the state and the federal government have tried to paint that into this nefarious... Um, money laundering. Money laundering, you know, we're defending criminals. No, we're defending ourselves from an overzealous government is what we're doing. In the federal indictment, they actually mention um, a conversation. They mention a conversation where they're talking about increasing dues for their members because how many banditos were arrested and held on a million dollar bond? Bond, yeah. Yeah, that's a worthy cause to fight. That's a worthy cause to fight, I think. Was, is Abel Reyna a, a fall guy for something else or something else or something bigger? I don't know. I just kind of think like Abel Reyna couldn't either he's comp he completely screwed this whole thing up or because of this other Fed investigation, this, this other kind of thing on, this, on the backside, going back to what the caller was talking about, there's some sort of politics or something else behind him that he's going down for it. And he, you know, he's involved in it, but he's not smart enough to pull this off or he's... <coughs> Not smart enough, and smart enough, and just screwed the whole thing up. Well, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand from the people <coughs> that I know who are from Waco, Reina, before he got elected DA, had no background in criminal law. I you know anything about that? I, I, I thought he was a criminal defense <coughs> attorney for a long while. I know he had a he, he was, had a pri well he had a private practice, okay. and I think kind of along the lines of what we had talked about a couple of weeks ago, there was kind of this perhaps good old boy system, the way things worked out in Waco. I'm not sure that he ever really did any heavy lifting on the criminal defense side, but his family was very well, well connected politically. We, we certainly got the story about his what, <coughs> grandfather, great grandfather that went from janitor to judge or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But mops mm. to, what did Castro say? Mops to, to politician, the whole rags to riches, the whole, I was a, I'm a Mexican, but now I'm an American. Oh, I'm sorry, no. We're but I, with that. Yeah, no, 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 no. We were talking about it last week, though. At the same time, though, um, the guy's wearing some forty thousand dollar Rolex. Um, ben yeah. didn't notice that. I hadn't even noticed. It. <coughs> I mean, it's, I mean, and, and I escapes Mark. It's no just, nice watches escape Mark. <laughs> the whole thing was bizarre. It's just the whole thing was bizarre, and uh, you led the way through the whole thing. And Thomas, which is amazing to me. It's just amazing. So, okay, so what? So you're there for two or three weeks. Neither of you live in Waco. Seven. Yeah. Uh, pardon me. Yeah. Seven. Seven weeks. Seven. Neither of you live in Waco. What? And so you guys are, you're holed up and you're, and you're doing this, this movie thing where, you know, like Matthew McConaughey and, and, uh, and, and who, Sandra Bullock are, you know, you know, cracking fish and drinking beer and talking about the case for like three, seven uh, weeks K of it. Casey or? was a den mom for seven weeks. <laughs> I did feel like I was running a frat house because it was like me and then the two motorcycle experts and then the two, my co-counsel. So I was the only woman in the house with like six guys. We come home from 
you know, court. There's no beer. Toilet seats up. Like, <laughs> where's dinner? The I mean, it was just. Yeah, I needed like a chair and a pitchfork at some point. <laughs> but they were they were a hell of a team, and they were a hell of a team. Like we couldn't have we couldn't have did what we did without y'all. Did you think in Waco when you all were living there for the months that you were there that uh, people recognized you? That you oh, absolutely yes. yeah really yes. absolutely the the people that would just come up to us like the restaurant owners or <coughs> you know, ladies walking their dog yeah. and. The kindest words, we're so sorry that this is happening to you. They touch Jake's beard. Um, we're praying for you. He does you. have a nice beard. They talk about Raina's cocaine habit, which I thought was so bizarre. Because wow. I, the first time I'd been to Waco was my first appearance on this case. I, d I don't know anybody. I don't know the local lay of the land. But everybody talked about this cocaine habit that the DA has. And I, <laughs> it's the damnedest thing. That's amazing because I think we have a caller. We do. It's amazing that we have a caller. Is that what you're saying? Well, I was kind of trying to transition, <laughs> but that's why you're the point. You know, I know what I mean? I know. Okay, we got another call here, so let's get to their question. Hello, thanks for calling. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Uh, this is uh, so educational hearing about the blatant disregard for the law that uh, y'all had to go through. And um, Well, Julio is colored amazed that you even called, so, you know. <laughs> Casey mentioned um, that her subpoenas weren't... Um, followed by the judge, that they were just blatantly um, disobeyed. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the subpoena is, why it's so important, and what a lawyer can do in that kind of situation <coughs> when the judge refuses to enforce a properly filed and served subpoena. And I'll take the answer off air. Thank you. Recuse the judge. <laughs> so in our case, I'd had such difficulty getting discovery um, and there's this legal fiction that, that, that 3914 is the only, that the Michael Morton Act is the only way to get discovery. I filed like 10 subpoenas and didn't get responsive documents. So I started off in this hearing trying to, you know, file a motion to compel responsive documents. And for reasons I will never understand, Judge Strother said, I'm not going I'm not going to enforce your subpoenas. In fact, I'm not going to read what was produced or even your subpoena. I'm just going to rule for the state. Wow. But were the, okay, so were the subpoena. led right into the recusal of Judge Strother. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. you were, the, the subpoenas were going to state agencies? Yes. Okay. Um, so theoretically, under, under the new Michael Morton Act, 3914, that stuff should come to you via discovery, right? Should. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing to me that the judge wouldn't even enforce it through that way, through the statute. And and who was moving to quash? Was it was the district attorney's office acting as the agents for those agencies? So interestingly, when we were in front of Judge Strother, it was the district attorney that was moving to quash these subpoenas because, by all accounts, I mean, I often felt ganged up on, mm -hmm. like I was fighting two prosecutors, and I and I. I said that to Judge Strother. Like, I don't trust you. He would tell me to be quiet. I can make my record later, and I, I don't believe you. And then when I tried to make my record, I was like, this is why I don't believe you. You don't tell the truth. Um, when we got in front of Judge Johnson, who, Matt Johnson, I will say, one of the fairest trials I've ever gotten, like just balls and strikes. I, I have no complaints about him. By the time we got in front of Judge Johnson, the DA's office wasn't moving to quash subpoenas. DPS was coming in. Or the city attorney. Or the city wow, attorney. Wow, really? And moving to quash their own subpoenas. I had, so Thomas and I did a little, um, did a little recon ourselves. I'd gotten invited to uh, a Sunday coffee with a lawyer for the attorney general's office that is representing some DPS agents. Mm -hmm. And because he'd been so dishonest with me, we recorded the conversation. <laughs> wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And then in the, in the course of this hour and 20 minute recorded conversation says that you're right. Rain is not giving you everything. Just said it. I don't know that I believe him. I think it's self-serving. I think they're both lying weasels. And when the ship goes down, they start to cannibalize and jump ship. So Did they're you have equally culpable. Did you have people pointing fingers later Absolutely, on? Absolutely, they're doing it now. They're gonna poke somebody's eye out. They're doing it right now. 
I mean, what a train wreck. Just it was a fun train, train wreck, wreck, though. Well, I mean, just the way this case is being handled. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it seems like it's just been bungled from the beginning by the state. Um, just, can we say the government? Can we say the government? Because sure. honestly, I, f I can't prove this, but everything that I have seen and circumstantially, Waco was part of that federal investigation and something went wrong somewhere and Waco got stuck holding the bag. Whether Raina reached for it or it was dropped in his lap, he's got it now. He's got it. And because the feds are keeping their evidence as close to their vest, because they can, because there's no discovery in federal court, and hell, you can't even subpoena a federal agent to show up without the government's permission. Right. So as long as they sit up there in their ivory tower and they hide that evidence, we're never going to know. We're never going to know what happened. And so people like Abel Reyna and what's going on in Waco, get, it gets to keep happening until our federal government gets checked, because they are out of control. Just... This, this idea that you have to have their permission to subpoena them. So, so if you let the ATF do all your ballistics testing, then a defense attorney can't even subpoena that guy to show up and explain what the hell he did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. What is this? What, I mean, what is this? I saw that movie. Have you seen that movie, Atomic Blonde? No. I have not. No. Yeah, I saw it. It's all about, like, fe the, the government covering everything, and it turns out the CIA is behind everything. And I'm thinking to myself, this is, this is what's going on. Federal government's behind everything. They got, there's, there's money going in places that we have no idea where, and there's people making decisions that we'll never know about, and nobody knows anything. And Abel Reyna got stuck holding the bag, and Casey Gocher came in there and well, shook some stuff up. I want to come up. back to that, that, your thought on that in a moment, but we got another call coming in, so let's jump on the phone line here and get another caller in. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hey, thanks for, thanks for uh, taking the call. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's been a great show. Um, I have a question and a couple questions for Casey. Um, I'm curious how much you think the state's case will change uh, when, if they decide to retry Jake, and also if you think there's uh, potential for the state to have conflicting theories of prosecution for each of the other 150-some-odd defendants. Thanks for the call. So, number one, I do not believe that this district attorney's office is going to re-prosecute Jake Carzall, given the material misrepresentations and outright lies that, that, that some of those folks told during trial. Um, they've made themself, themselves witnesses in any further proceedings. So I don't think this DA's office is going to re-prosecute Jake. I think any DA um, with eyes and ears and a working brain that spoke to the speaks to the jury, looks at the evidence that was brought in at trial, uh, will dismiss 98% of these cases, Jake's included. There are some folks who were there that day engaging in organized crime with the specific purpose of mayhem, hurting people, and there could be some successful prosecutions. There's a man named Jesus Rodriguez. <laughs> He is on camera, plain as day, being shot in the back through the heart and then again in the face and then stomped in the face by two men that are clearly identifiable. Why is that prosecution not first? This is, this is after, I might yeah. add. He is responding. He's not even in a club. Yeah, he's he's a Vietnam vet, a Purple Heart recipient. And he, and he is responding to men firing into a crowd and takes it upon himself to go and... <coughs> and throat punch and try, attempt to disarm one of those men. Shot in the back, shot in the face, and stomped in the face. And the man that did it, his name is Jacob uh, Reese. And he's a Cossack. And it's plain as day, it's on the poll cam. Why is that prosecution not first? Yeah. Cold-blooded I mean murder at oh. noon on a Sunday in Waco. You got it on video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his cohort was later killed by the police as he attempted to shoot Jake as Jake was on the ground. But you prosecute Jake Carzal first because he's a bandito. Yeah. Sort of feeds into that same idea of, of there's just some federal machination going on here. Well, when's the federal case set to go to trial? February the 12th, I think. It's in fe early February of 2018. I mean, in San Antonio or here? San Antonio. San, San Antonio. Antonio. That's amazing. This whole thing is just absolutely amazing. It's one of the things you're going to have be having trials, like mock trials, 30 years from now about, I think. Mm. 
Well, I mean, it's not, it, 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 to me, it's not all that surprising. I mean, the feds have probably invested a lot of time and resources into their case, a lot more than, than DPS and, and Reina's office have. And I don't think they're going to be, I mean, this is just my theory, that they probably are going <coughs> to, as you suggest, take the low-hanging fruit rather than potentially expose some of the key witnesses in a federal trial uh, to cross-examination in a state case. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, why, why would they allow that to happen? Um, and so, like you're saying, there probably is some manipulation behind the scenes. Um, yeah, and I, and I want to say that um, the DPS agents, they were a significant part of the federal investigation. So they, they were kind of wearing two hats. Yeah. I have some correspondence between Raina's office and DPS where Raina was attempting to get evidence favorable to the state's case, mind you. He never made a Brady request for a defendant um, and was told that a lot of what we have is under federal protective order. And so they are, in fact, the Department of Public Safety. I believe the director's name is Tim McGraw. Um, they are sitting on evidence. Yeah. And they're just not turning it over. Mm. I think we have one, one more call. Let's try and get it in here before we go. <coughs> Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Stephen McGraw, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I have two questions. Uh, You're only, you can only have one. I'm sorry. Okay. No. Well, just. You can pick which one you want to a answer. <laughs> so the first one is, you, you know, y'all were talking about the federal government and the federal government's reach, and, and I understand that. What do you think or how much, or do you think there's any culpability on the part of local law enforcement who was there that day when this whole thing happened? Is, is, and is that a sign of something else that we see going on in society um, this day with law enforcement all across the country? And then the second question is a little bit more personal to, to Ms. Gotro. What was it like for your client the moment that the judge declared the mistrial? How does he feel today? How does he feel after that? I know mean, you can't say personal things and privileged things that y'all talked about, but what, how, is he, how is he feeling after this whole thing? Because it was hard for you, and you've already said it, it was really hard on him. So how, was, how did he react afterwards? Thanks, Thanks for the call. We only got about a minute, guys, so be oh. brief in your answers. I think, I think local law enforcement did everything they could with the information they had. Um, Agreed. They absolutely saved lives that day, and they just walked into a mess. One of the one of the SWAT officers had said that his rifle wasn't even the ready position; he had it in the back seat. So I think that they they local law enforcement had been misled as well. And with respect to Jake, um, it's hard to describe the. He has two boys. They are eight and eleven. Uh, Dylan and. Jackson, and it's it's hard to describe what it's like to have to say goodbye, right? When to hug them and know that that might be the last time you see them, and so relief, elated, happy. I'd like to keep him that way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and there's a picture of you and your client. Um, Jake. Yeah, I mean, you know, hey, look, uh, a lot of people don't really understand but a mistrial is that's huge especially in this i mean a lot of people will say well but and they'll come up with some excuse but the reality is uh that's a big deal it's a really really big deal and this and is where my ability to tune out those naysayers really yeah. comes in handy and, and that so, was a win for us that was so, a win. so i appreciate that i appreciate you guys coming on the show and sharing your stories we gotta we gotta wrap this thing up now but uh Thomas Lane, Casey Gutro, appreciate you guys coming on, sharing, for having taking us. the time this week and telling us all about Waco. Julio, settle down on the turkey, man. I, I, I got goosebumps from this show. All right. That's all the time we got, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back next week with another new episode of Reasonable Doubt. Check us out on Twitter and Facebook for all the latest episodes and updates. That's it for tonight. For Julio Vela, I'm Jimmy Ardwan. See you all next week. Good night. Peace. Look up.